Thank you very much, Sasha, for the introduction. And uh, also thank you very much for inviting me to contribute for this exciting event. Uh, I'd like also to thank Sandus for sponsoring this educational initiative. And we know the contribution of Sandus toward pediatric endocrinology is really huge, and this is just a small example of that. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate the first wave uh, of pediatric uh, endocrinology in a nutshell. And uh, as Rasha mentioned, this wave is going to uh, focus mainly on two areas of pediatric endocrinology, namely growth and subclinical or growth hormone deficiency and subclinical hypothyroidism. Uh, I don't know if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen, Russia? Right, so I assume you can see it. Yes, Abdel Hadi, I can see your screen. Can you just make the slide show, please? Yeah, yeah, I see. Thank you. So this evening, we're going to have two excellent speakers, uh, Professor Mehul Datani and Professor just select where you think your specialty or your uh, title will fit. Are you a pediatric endocrinologist, general pediatrician, general practitioner, adult endocrinologist? And if you are not any of these four, you can just take none of the above. And this will give us really an, an idea on the level of audience who are with us tonight. Very good, so now I get an answer. This is, the majority are general pediatrician followed by pediatric endocrinologists, and there are maybe one or two adult endocrinologists. Now, there's one thing I'd like you to, to remember is you will receive the online certificate uh, by email uh, next within the next 48 hours, hopefully. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my good friend, Professor Mehel Datani. And I have to say, uh, Mehel is uh, a world expert in growth and pituitary disorder. Uh, he is one of the few people who can master uh, clinical work, research, as well as management. Uh, Mehel has been leading uh, a very busy endocrine service at the Great Ormond Street uh, uh, Hospital for Children and University College, or University College London, for the last few years. Uh, he, at the same time, he's also the president of the European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology. And uh, recently, he's also co-chairing the particularly main uh, thematic group of the endocrine or the European Endocrine Reference Network initiative. Uh, in the past, he chaired the Pediatric uh, uh, Endocrine and Diabetes Society, the British Pediatric, uh, the British Society for Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes for three years, and then he was uh, chairing the uh, SP uh, program organizing committee up until last year. So those of you who attend the SP meetings, you know who is now who is the brain uh, behind uh, the scientific program, at least for the last six, seven years. Uh, beside that, he established a very uh, renowned research group which focuses on the molecular basis of hypothalamic pituitary disease. And uh, 
along with his colleagues, he, they identified a number of novel genes implicated in the hypo uh, and the hypothalamic pituitary development in patients with congenital hypopituitarism. And recently, they are working to provide us with more understanding on the molecular basis of pediatric craniopharyngioma. Uh, it's not a surprise that he has more than 250 publications in a highly ranked journal. Uh, he also had at least uh, five book chapters, and he co-authors a number of textbooks. Uh, one of them is the famous uh, Brooks Clinical Pediatric Endocrinology on the seventh edition. Uh, Mehel also sits on numerous of advisory boards for uh, different pharmaceutical companies and uh, government uh, uh, bodies, and he also a member of editorial boards of various scientific journals. Uh, he was awarded uh, the S.P. Henning Anderson Award, as well as the Royal College of Pediatric and Child Health Donald Patterson Award for his scientific contribution to pediatric in general and pediatric endocrinology. Now, Mehel is going to, to take us uh, through the journey of uh, congenital or growth hormone deficiency, both the congenital and the acquired, as we understand it, in the next uh, in, uh, 2020. But before that, I got a question here, and I would just have an idea of uh, whether any of you uh, have children with growth hormone deficiency in their clinic. And what I want you to do is just to select yes or no in the next few seconds. After that, it's all going to be. So it's, it's nearly 60% or more than 60%, nearly 70% of our audience have patients with growth hormone deficiency, and I'm sure they're going to be interactive with you, Mehel. So it is all yours now, Mehel, and uh, hopefully you are going to enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Abdul Habi, for that uh, nice introduction. And thank you to Rasha for inviting me as well. So, so I think I need to share uh, my screen now. So try and get that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, is the screen okay? Can you see it? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the diagnosis and management of growth hormone deficiency, uh, and I've called it an update for 2020, but really the work summarizes of some of, some of the advances over the last few years uh, in the area. So uh, basically, this is uh, a classic sort of slide uh, showing you the infancy, childhood, pubertal model of growth. And it's a slide that was created in the 18th century by Comte de Montbéard of his son, and here you see the distance uh, curve and the velocity curve for growth. And what you see here is that there are clearly three phases of growth, the infancy, childhood, and pubertal phase. And again, in the velocity, you start off uh, after birth with a very high growth velocity, rapidly declining in the first two to three years of life, steady rate in childhood, dip here just before the onset of the pubertal growth spurt, then you have the pubertal growth spurt, with cessation of growth thereafter. And this is really what most children should follow in their lives. Okay, so what actually regulates this? And we know that at each of the phases, there's different regulatory factors. So in infancy, nutrition uh, is extremely important, but the growth hormone an IGF-1 axis also starts becoming increasingly uh, important after the first few months of life. In childhood, it's a growth hormone IGF-1 axis, plus other factors such as, for instance, thyroxin. And at puberty, it's the GH and IGF-1 axis and sex steroids that are important. So moving on, when we talk about growth hormone deficiency, there are a number of causes. These may be congenital or acquired. And congenital causes include genetic causes or those associated with structural defects of the brain, such as agenesis of the corpus callosum, septoptic dysplasia, holobras and cephaly or hydrocephalus, those associated with midline facial defects, such as cleft lip and palate, or single central incisor. Acquired causes include trauma, which may be prenatal or perinatal, 
infections such as meningitis and encephalitis, and CNS tumors such as craniopharyngioma, uh, pituitary germinoma, pituitary adenoma, and optic glioma. But there may be inflammatory lesions such as Langerhans cell histiocytosis or postcranial irradiation as children with tumors are fortunately now surviving uh, for a longer time. Post chemotherapy, pituitary infarction are other rare causes. And this funny uh, thing called neurosecretion dysfunction, where you have a normal response to a growth one provocation test, but a low IGF one, a poor growth rate, and an abnormal secretory pattern of growth hormone. And more about that a bit later. And then psychosocial deprivation, um, which is uh, a very odd condition, which mimics growth hormone deficiency. So this is a young man who first presented as a baby. And you can see the classical features there of frontal mossing, depressed nasal bridge there. Uh, he looks much younger than his years. Uh, he looks a bit chubby. Uh, and basically, he may have a history of early uh, hypoglycemia or jaundice. He may have a family history of the condition. Uh, and, the, and then the classic physical findings, which are listed there. Uh, and I've already talked about some of them. But he may have delayed dentition, bone maturation, increased subcutaneous fat, reduced muscle mass with delayed gross motor skills, uh, thin sparse hair, a high-pitched voice, slow nail growth. And if you haven't got all that, then he may present later on with short stature and a poor growth velocity. And this child indeed is growth hormone deficient and later turned out to have a mutation in the gene that makes growth hormone, the growth hormone, uh, the GH1 gene. So the first question, any child with a height of min less than minus two standard deviation scores should be investigated with a GH provocation test to exclude a diagnosis of GH deficiency, true or false? Good, I think I would agree with that. I think the answer should be false there because uh, not every child needs a growth hormone provocation test. And we'll talk a little bit about how we should screen these children uh, as to who should and who shouldn't have it. Sorry, I think uh, it's a bit stuck. Right, okay. Okay, this is the second question. Which of the following can be a useful adjunct to the diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency. First, the birth weight, B, MRI of the pituitary, C, early AM cortisol, D, IGF-1 concentration, E, genetic testing. So if you vote now, and then we can look at the results. Okay, so it's, it's a bit of a split, isn't it? 13% for birth weight, 17% for MRI, 64% uh, for IGF-1, 1% only for early AM cortisol, and 5% for genetic testing. And I think the two commonest things are MRI of the pituitary and IGF-1 concentration. And I agree that IGF-1 concentration certainly is at the top, but MRI of the pituitary, as I'll show you, can be useful and genetic testing, I think we're at the very early stages. I think that's a fair reflection, really. Okay, so when we first ex examine a child who we suspect of having growth hormone deficiency, what we should look at is, first of all, the oxology. So this is the assessment of the height and weight um, and other markers, such as skin fold thicknesses, etc. cetera. Uh, then uh, biochemical assessment, the use of neuroimaging, which we'll discuss, and the use of genetics. And basically, biochemistry includes direct growth hormone measurements, usually after provocation, the measurement of IGF-1 and IGF-BP3, and the measurement of other hormones to look for combined pituitary hormone deficiency. Now, looking at the oxology, first of all, this is a study we did retrospectively many years ago, and basically looked at 39 children who were congenital, congenitally growth hormone deficient, 
And basically, they were treated uh, uh, quite late. Um, you know, some of them weren't treated for up to two, two years. And they were monitored carefully at that time. And what we see here is the isolated GHD in white, the combined pituitary hormone deficiency in gray, and in black there are those children with midline defects as well as pituitary hormone deficiency. And first of all, you see the effect here on weight. And what you can see is that with all of them, the weight does go down, but less so with the midline defects and the combined pituitary hormone deficiency. Secondly, you can see the effect on length. And now you can see that by six months, there's quite a marked deficit in the length in these children. So the textbooks used to say you don't need growth hormone in the first year of life, but you do. You can see even with the IGHD, you fail very quickly in terms of your growth and the severe con congenital growth hormone deficiency. And finally, BMI. And it's interesting to see that the BMI is spared or actually increased in those with midline defects and combined pituitary hormone deficiencies. So how do you actually make the diagnosis very early on? And this is a nice study from Gerard Binder, where they looked at neonatal screening cards in normal children and in severe GHD babies in retrospect. And they measured GH on a highly sensitive polyclonal ELISA. And they used a cutoff of seven micrograms per liter, which gave them 100% sensitivity. So you picked up all the children with GHD and 98% specificity. So you excluded all the normal children. So fantastic results, but obviously not all of us have uh, access to this. And, you know, prospectively, it's quite difficult to suspect GHD early on. So how do you really diagnose it in the real world? And in the UK, we're expected to do two tests to establish a diagnosis of GHD or GH insufficiency. One test if the child's got CNS pathology irradiated previously, has multiple pituitary hormone deficiency or a genetic defect. And the tests of GH secretion include physiological tests, such as sleep, exercise and 24-hour profiles, pharmacological provocation tests, such as an eye insulin tolerance test, clonidine, glucagon, arginine, and GHRH tests, and surrogate markers, the use of IGF-1 and IGF-BP3. Now, in practice, most of us will use the surrogate markers and a pharmacological provocation test. The problem is that there are too many tests, uh, more than 34 different tests and 189 different combinations reported. There is no gold standard and there's a lack of normative data. We can't perform GH simulation tests in completely normal children ethically. And the tests show poor reproducibility. So sometimes you do a test on one day, you'll get one result. On another day, you'll get another result. And it's, it's a continuous distribution of growth hormone and of stature. So it's difficult to then say we're going to get a cutoff, which is going to reflect, uh, you know, whether a child's growth hormone deficient or not. And the tests are also all pharmacological and non-physiological. And when you perform the test, you perform it in one day. But actually, that may not equate to what's happening over the year and the growth velocity over the year. As I've said, the cutoffs are artificial. We use the markers of sensitivity and specificity, but it's also important to remember that the growth hormone assay and the test use are very important. In one study, we, on a single sample processed in six different assays, there were six-fold differences, basically, in the, in the growth hormone value. The test can be hazardous, and deaths have been reported with both glucagon tests and ITTs, usually with overcorrection of hypoglycemia. And these tests can be difficult to interpret in obese children, as I'll show you in a minute. So this is a study which we did many, many years ago uh, when I first started in pediatric endocrinology. And we looked at a cohort of children and we used height velocity as a gold standard and then looked at the GH concentrations and an insulin tolerance test using a very specific uh, assay called the Hybritech assay, which is now discontinued. And what you see is if you've got a lower cutoff you're good at excluding normal children, so your specificity is high, but you don't pick up all children with growth hormone deficiency. If you've got a higher cutoff, it's the opposite. So your sensitivity is better. You do pick up all children with growth hormone deficiency, but along the way, you'll also end up treating some normal children. So there's no perfect balance. Nothing is 100% there, which is what we'd like. But this is life, and it doesn't exist. Uh, the, the perfection doesn't exist for stimulation tests. 
What about the variability between tests? So this is a nice study from Mohammed Magni's group uh, in 2009, and they looked at 48 children who were shown to be growth hormone deficient on an insulin tolerance test and an arginine test, and they had a glucagon test on a separate day. Now, their cutoffs was 10 micrograms per litre, which arguably is a little bit higher. And basically what that showed was that the median GH peak was higher in response to the glucagon test, and that 28 out of the 48 patients actually passed the glucagon test, but yet had failed the ITT and arginine test. And there was no difference whether they were IGHD or MPHD patients, and no difference whether or not they had structural defects of the HP axis. What about the use of sex steroid priming? So I tend to use sex steroid priming, and I'm a believer in this, but it's a controversial area in pediatric endocrinology. So GH responsiveness to provocation is increased by estrogen. Now, this SP survey performed a few years ago showed that sex steroid priming was used for boys by only 50% of respondents and for girls by 41%. And in the US, it was shown that two thirds of US pediatric endocrinologists do not use priming. Now, this study by Mary Natal is quite important because it showed that 61% of normal Tanner stage one and 44% of normal Tanner stage two, so these are normal children, fail GH provocation tests without priming and the response is improved by estrogen priming. But actually, it's a study by Martinez et al., which is a nice controlled study, small numbers, but nevertheless an important study, 15 short prepubertal GHD children compared with 44 short normal children. And they did a blind RCT. So they used micronized es uh, uh, estradiol valerate for three days or placebo prior to the arginine clonidine test. And then they crossed over to the opposite treatment four weeks later and repeated the process. And what they find is in the short normal B children or the, the, the short stature children with normal endocrinology, uh, what you would find is basically the mean basal GH increased uh, on estrogen. And also there was an increase in the maximum GH in, in that cohort compared to the GHD where priming really didn't change it. So priming is useful basically for actually differentiating between your short normals and your GHD patients uh, more effectively. And its greatest benefit is in those aged eight to 12 years. So this uh, SP uh, consensus uh, by the Clinical Practice Committee in 2010 recommended priming in girls aged uh, over 11 and a half years and boys aged over 13 years, who show either no or early signs of puberty. Now I'd argue that maybe you need to use lower cutoffs of 10 years, maybe 11 years or thereabouts. What about obesity? How does that affect growth hormone secretion? So several studies have shown that endogenous growth hormone secretion is negatively correlated to body mass index in children. And this study by Stanley et al. in 2009 was very well uh, performed. It looked at the effect of BMI on peak GH to provocation. Looking at 116 children, the only criticism is they did use a variety of unprimed uh, stimulation tests. However, stepwise multivariate regression analysis showed that BMI, the type of the stimulation test, and the log of IGF-1 were the only significant predictors of the log of the peak growth hormone. And BMI SDS significantly and negatively correlated with the log peak GH, as I'll show you here. So this is all the children and the prepubertal children. And what you can see is the higher the BMI, the lower your growth hormone. What's even more important to realize is that this can occur within a normal weight cohort, basically. So these are children whose uh, weights range, say, from uh, minus one SDS to greater than one SDS here. Yeah. And the higher the BMI, the more likely you are to fail the GH provocation test. And they're not excessively obese either. What about IGF-1 and IGF-PP3? So when these uh, uh, measurements first came in, uh, everybody thought we had the answer and we wouldn't need to do GH provocation tests. We could just use these uh, measurements. IGF-1 is a product of the interaction of growth hormone with a somatogenic receptor in the liver, and it binds to six binding proteins, of which IGF-PP3 is the most abundant 
also growth hormone regulated, and it binds both IGF-1 and IGF-B3 bind to an acid label subunit and form a high molecular weight ternary complex, which is essential for normal growth. As I've said, both IGF-1 and BB3 are GH dependent, but it's important to remember that IGF-1 may be low in malnourished children, in children with liver or renal disease, and in children with hypothyroidism. So these are our data really looking at, again, children who are GH insufficient and those who are non-GH insufficient, basically. And you can see that there is an overlap in the IGF-1 SDS in these groups, prepubertal, pubertal. Uh, and really, you can't really distinguish between the two cohorts easily here. Same is true of IGF BP3. Maybe at puberty, it's a bit of a better, better uh, um, uh, uh, disting distinguishing between the two cohorts. So I'm now going to move on to my first case. So this is a girl who presented at the age of 3.4 years to me with short stature, height minus 3.8 standard deviation scores, weight minus 1.9 SDS. Height velocity was low at 3.6 centimeters per year. She had frontal bossing and depressed nasal bridge. Uh, there was little else of note in her history. She had a good birth weight, parents were non-consanguinous, and she was otherwise generally well and developing normally. Karyotype was normal. Uh, the thyroid hormone uh, was normal. The cortisol was normal. Uh, IGF-1 was completely undetectable. IGF-BP3, low normal. So I looked at her and I thought, this has to be growth hormone deficiency. You know, let's just do the test and prove it, and we'll see. So I did a glucagon test, and what you can see here is that she had an excellent growth hormone peak of 21.1 uh, micrograms per liter, which is pretty high. Normal cortisol as well with a peak of 960. But it's interesting here because she's hypoglycemic at the start of the test with a blood glucose of 2.9. And actually, those growth hormone values weren't particularly high there. So severe short stature, poor growth velocity, clinical findings of GHD, low IGF-1, and a normal GH response at stimulation. What would you do next? A, perform an IGF-1 generation test. B, perform an overnight growth hormone profile. C, perform an MRI scan of the brain and pituitary. D is B and C together. And E, watch and wait. Yep, so we've got a majority uh, of B and C. Um, okay. So this is what we did. So we did an overnight growth hormone profile. And normally you should get three good peaks of over seven micrograms per liter. She got one peak just over that. And then we did an MRI. And what that showed us is that she has a small anterior pituitary and an ectopic posterior pituitary here, okay? And there's no stalk connecting the two. This is the normal scan showing a normal anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary there. So game, set, and match, okay? So she had growth hormone deficiency with a structurally abnormal pituitary. We started on growth hormone. Her growth, hormone, her growth velocity increased. And her IGF-1 and BP-3 started normalizing. And this is the growth charts showing gradual catch-up there. These are the parents there. And the weight's also increasing. So is the MRI useful in congenital hypopituitarism and GHD? So we looked at 170 children who, with or at risk of hypopituitarism, of whom 84 had optic nerve hypoplasia. And of those 170 children, 137 had hypopituitarism, and of those, only 13 had normal MRIs, 124 had abnormal MRI scans. And patients with optic nerve hypoplasia are more likely to have midline abnormalities, as one would predict, such as absent septum pellucidum or corpus callosum. And if you see this appearance, a tiny anterior pituitary, absent stalk, and an ectopic posterior pituitary, then the risk of hypopituitarism is 27 times greater. 
What about genetics? So I won't spend much time on it. It's an area I'm very particularly interested in. And we know that many genes now regulate the hypothalamus and pituitary in terms of development. And we're learning more and more about these genes as we go on. And this is from a recent paper that we've published in JCM, a review. And basically what it shows is all the different genes, very variable phenotypes, some with extra pituitary phenotypes, uh, and some with just isolated GHD, basically. And their inheritance can be variable to recessive, dominant, X-linked. So really a very variable feast. And there's more. So this is the second slide. And so you can see that there are already around 30 to 35 genes implicated and more and more come to light. But generally, these account for very small proportions of all the cases. This is a, just uh, to show you uh, one example of the genetics. And these are the dwarfs of SIN, as they're called. This is a normal adult endocrinologist and the two patients are both adults here, never been treated with GA. So in our experience, we did screen children with IGHD, 224 patients, 77% sporadic, 23% familial. And we found changes in GH1 and GHRHR in 41 patients from 21 pedigrees. And we found GH1 mutations in 26 patients, um, of which four were novel, 7% of the overall cohort, but 77% of those patients were familial cases. GHRHR, 15 patients from seven unrelated families, all of Asian origin. Uh, three had novel mutations, and it was 3.7% of the cohort, and as I've said, all familial. And this is just one such family where we had, in fact, two families. In the first family, we had three affected. In the second family, only one. Both were consanguineous pedigrees. And basically, uh, these two boys presented quite late on with relatively subtle short stature, heights of minus 2 and minus 1.23 SDS. And they had anterior pituitary hypoplasia, complete GH deficiency. They were treated with growth hormone and did very well in terms of their final height. The sister, on the other hand, had never been treated, and she also had the GHRHR mutation, uh, but she got a height of 146, and her mother was 145. So these are very subtle abnormalities in terms of height uh, with mild loss of function mutations. And this girl presented earlier and did very well on her growth hormone treatment with a good fine light of 166 centimeters. And this is their growth chart. So uh, mild sort of deceleration, not classic congenital growth hormone deficiency, but done beautifully really on growth hormone treatment. And they have a small anterior pituitary which is structurally normal on MRI. What about treatment of growth hormone? So we use recombinant human growth hormone, 20 to 35 micrograms per kilogram per day. And that achieves increase in growth velocity and an adult height of minus 0.8 to minus 1.5 SDS. And these are the KIGS data, which I'll show you in a minute. There are controversies. What is the best dose? What do you start with? Do you, how do you increase it? How do you monitor it? Do you use IGF-1 to change your dose? Um, what about increasing the doses at puberty? What about responsiveness? Um, what makes one patient different from another in terms of responsiveness? The major factors affecting final height are peak growth hormone, parental height, and the age at the start of growth hormone. And so this is the big kid study showing the starting height and near adult height in males and females uh, in, in a large cohort of Caucasian children with idiopathic growth hormone deficiency. And generally, they do well with treatment. But it's important to start early. And studies have shown that the delta height SDS is associated with age and GH treatment start. The earlier you start treatment, the greater the height gains, uh, basically. And this is shown here in this uh, bar chart, where the early children got a better delta height SDS from baseline to near adult height than those who started late. And this is shown nicely in this uh, patient uh, who presented quite late. And you can see that they'd already lost a lot of ground. Growth hormone was started, but they never made it to the mid parental height there because the growth hormone was started so late. But the main factor that affects responsiveness is probably adherence. And this is a chronic condition involving daily injections. 
and this can impair adult height if they do not take it. So there are challenges now because we have fewer resources available to monitor patients' adherence. We have less CNS support and an epidemic like uh, or pandemic like COVID, for instance, where there's less contact with the patients might make the whole thing worse. Now, up to 82% of pediatric patients miss some doses, depending on which study you read. And this is unrelated to the age, sex, and underlying diagnosis. But adherence patterns do change during treatment. So many children start off well and then don't adhere after that. And this study by Cutfield et al. looked at 177 patients, and they looked at the number of GH files requested and the number returned. And 66% of patients were non-compliant, but less than 85% adherence. And the compliance is associated with the height velocity SDS, as you can see here. This is the low compliance, missing more than three injections a week. Medium compliance, missing more than one. And high compliance, missing only one injection per week. And you can see that the height velocity is better with the higher compliance. What about safety of growth hormone? There have been a number of studies recently and how do you monitor safety? So we use IGF-1 and IGF-BB3 to monitor this, but there are very few long-term data looking at that. There are safety issues. Benign intracranial hypertension, for instance, is a rare complication, but nevertheless important. And there have been previous studies which show that pituitary-derived growth hormone administered in high doses can be associated with creutzfeldt jakob disease and colonic cancer. And there's a risk of type 2 diabetes, particularly in organic forms of GHD, versus idiopathic. And obviously malignancy is the one worry. Data from large databases suggests that growth hormone does not increase the risk for new malignancy in children without risk factors, but may increase the risk of second malignancy in previously treated children. And so the big study recently that's been published is a safety and appropriateness of growth hormone treatment in Europe, the SAID study, looking at around 30,000 low-risk children treated with growth hormone between 1980 to 1990 from eight countries who detained 18 years by the census date of 2009 to 2010. Now the French groups published early and they showed an increased all-cause mortality, particularly with GH doses greater than 50 micrograms per kilogram. And there was increased bone tumor mortality and an increased cardiovascular mortality due to some arachnoid or intracerebral hemorrhage. However, this was not confirmed in the other countries, the Swedish, Belgian, and Dutch reports to start with. Uh, and then more recently, the French group reported an increased stroke-related standardized uh, incidence ratio of 3.5 to 7 compared with two other registries, the Dijon and Oxford registries. And this was predominantly hemorrhagic stroke and subarachnoid hemorrhage. But there have been several criticisms of these studies because the control populations did not really represent uh, similar findings to the French populations, for instance. Dijon is a small city uh, with a low cardiovascular morbidity and few cases of stroke, and Oxford has a high socioeconomic index with very low incidence of vascular diseases. And all patients less than 35 years were reported together, uh, and the risk was that the children and younger individuals dilute the incidence rate. So more recently, uh, the analysis of the whole court from eight countries has been published in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology, and I'll just rush, run through this fairly quickly. So these patients were stratified according to their pre-treatment perceived mortality risk from underlying disease, and they were followed for cause-specific mortality. And so these were the four groups, the low groups, the moderate, and the high groups, basically. The low groups were mainly IGHD and other conditions such as ISS, and skeletal dysplasia. The, low, the other group was SGA, and then MPHD with some uh, benign pituitary tumors and syndromes, and the high risk were all malignancies and craniopharyngiomas and chronic renal failure and conditions to Bloom syndrome. And you can see that the SMR increases, and this is because of the underlying conditions, really. The cumulative dose did not affect mortality, particularly in the low-dose group, and the all-cause mortality was not related to the dose, and the highest mortality in those was the, in those with tumor diagnosis before the GH was started. So pre-existing CNS tumors were particularly high risk. So the conclusions with the SAID study, there's no significant increase in overall mortality in low-risk patients with IGHD or ISS, but those with an inherent increased mortality risk, this probably relates to the underlying diagnosis.
And the strengths of the SAID study are large sample size, extended follow-up and multinational nature of the study, but there are weaknesses. There's a lack of a non-treated GHD population. Uh, confounding factors haven't really been controlled. And there are eight countries with heterogeneous sort of diagnostic criteria and clinical practice. A Swedish study recently published by Alberts and Wickland et al. looked at mortality in over nearly 4,000 patients with GHD, ISS, or SGA, treated between 1985 and 2010. And they developed a mortality model of the general, Swedish general population, adjusting for birth characteristics, sex, age intervals, congenital anomalies, and calendar year to estimate the SMR, and to apply this model to assess expected deaths in this uh, cohort. And the mortality ratio was 1.43. But if you use the mortality model, it's close to one. So they suggested that there was no difference in mortality once you corrected for birth characteristics and congenital abnormalities. And this consensus really from three societies, SP, GRS, and PS, suggests that many of the disorders we treat with GH in children and adults have an inherently higher mortality risk uh, and in most studies, therefore, the potential impact of GH treatment is difficult to distinguish from the impact of the underlying disorder. Available data do not indicate an increased risk of new primary cancers, but small numbers of subjects have been followed up in the long term with incomplete data. And basically, one has to watch out for uh, glucose intolerance and type 2 diabetes, but it's very low in pediatric patients with GHD or ISS. Uh, and although children with Turner syndrome and SGA are more likely to get glucose intolerance and type 2 diabetes, GH treatment does not seem to increase the incidence in these conditions. So what they recommend is monitoring of IGF-1, adrenal and thyroid function, HbA1c, and scoliosis. Growth hormone, it's important to remember, is not only important for growth, it's important for maintenance of blood glucose, increasing bone strength and muscle mass, decreasing fat mass, cardiovascular effects, and neurocognition and motor skills as well. Now I'm gonna finish off finally with transition and just a few slides on that. Transitioning GHD is a big topic. Uh, it's GHD in uh, adults are now treated with growth hormone for body composition normalization. And the recommendation is that they should be retested at the time of transition. But those with three or more pituitary hormone deficiencies and a low IGF-1 or genetic hypopituitarism do not need a retest. The tests, ITT and GHRH and arginine are the most commonly used. And the cutoff is five micrograms per liter for ITT and 19 micrograms per liter for GHRH arginine, depending on the body mass index. But more recent studies have suggested maybe the cutoff should be 5.6 micrograms per liter on an ITT. What's important to know is that 25 to 75% of GHD patients reverse their GHD at the time of transition. And there are a number of studies, and I don't have the time to go into those in detail. This study by Tober et al. showed that on retesting, around 62% of patients had a greater than 10 microgram per liter response. And these included both patients with partial GHD or those who were felt to be complete GHD previously. Other studies have shown reversal as well. The study by Magni et al., who suggested that those with an ectopic posterior pituitary do not normally reverse their growth hormone deficiency, whereas those with a normal posterior pituitary are more likely to. But Leger et al. showed that even those with an ectopic posterior pituitary in 22% of these patients reverse as well. And this study from Manchester showed that those with ectopic posterior pituitary do have lower growth hormone concentrations generally, but a small proportion do reverse as well. So more recently, there have been studies showing early reversal of GHD. So these studies have tested GHD patients as they enter puberty, not as they finish puberty. So these are all patients who have a structurally normal pituitary, and the reversal rate is reported to be up to 49%, basically. And these are studies, uh, basically, that have shown that GH discontinuation in those with GHD reversal does not lead to a reduction in final height. So if they reverse in early puberty and you stop GH, basically they will still achieve a reasonable final height compared to those who continue with the GH. 
So finally, this uh, case two, just to illustrate a couple of points here. This child presented at the age of 7.5 years, male with short stature. He had two sisters growing normally, and there was a past history of previous bilateral orchidopexies, but importantly, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. The child showed growth deceleration and hyperphagia, thought to be due to emotional deprivation. However, when the child was fostered at the age of four years, and his hyperphagia improved, but the growth did not accelerate. Normal thyroid function, CDAC screen, and inflammatory markers, and a low IGF-1. And a glucagon test was performed, showing a peak that was deficient at 4.9 micrograms per liter. The MRI was structurally normal, but showed a small anterior pituitary. And so he was started in growth hormone treatment at the age of eight years. He didn't go into puberty at the age of 13.9 years. And so we did an LHRH test, showed a low LH. We did a three-day and three-week test and suboptimal three-day response to testosterone and three-week response to testosterone as well. So we thought he had hypogonotrophic hypogonadism and we added testosterone to the growth hormone. Then he did very well. He got a very good height there, as you can see, above the 50th centile. And we decided to retest him at transition. He could, and his ITT now showed a normal peak of 7.7 .7 micrograms per liter. His LHRH test was normal of testosterone. And his testosterone was completely normal. So previous history of emotional deprivation, childhood growth hormone deficiency, normal or small anterior pituitary on MRI, excellent response to GH treatment, GH deficiency transitioned uh, to normality, and pubertal delay with good testicular progression on testosterone treatment, but later normal testicular function. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis here? A, GH deficiency due to emotional deprivation, B, transient childhood GH deficiency reversing at the time of transition, C, constitutional growth delay, D, organic GH deficiency. Okay, so a number of you have said organic GH deficiency. I would disagree with that because I think this child probably had emotional abuse. And I know even in foster care, he wasn't growing particularly well. But the reversal all suggests that of both the hypogonotrophic hypogonadism and, it, and the growth hormone deficiency. And, and emotional deprivation can almost present with hypopituitism. And it's important to realize that. So why does reversibility occur? Um, it may be due to transient GHD or lack of reproducibility of GH provocation tests or an increase in GH secretion in puberty or other factors of obesity. But the answer is, we don't know. And finally, what are the benefits of GH of transition? So increase in bone mineral density and mineralization. Um, benefits are largely unproven, although they're thought to be it is thought to be beneficial. There's no doubt about body composition. Uh, those who have persistent GHD and who discontinued GH in transition show decreased lean body mass and increased fat mass compared with those who are joint GH sufficient or continued GH after two years of, of observation. And there's a marked improvement in body composition with an increase in lean body mass and a reduction in fat mass with GH replacement. Cardiovascular effects are less clear it is thought that discontinuing GH will lead to a proatherogenic lipid profile. However, the effects of GH are not clear. And there are less clear effects on insulin sensitivity and quality of life. So to conclude, GHD can be a challenging diagnosis. It's a combination, really, of clinical, biochemical, neuroradiological, and genetic data. And that you've got to remember the wider effects of GH on body mass, uh, uh, sorry, bone mass, uh, lean body mass, uh, cardiovascular, neurocognitive, and safety is extremely important to consider. There are ongoing studies and there's a need for ongoing surveillance. So thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Mehal, for this comprehensive uh, talk. It really combines the clinical uh, part with the science as well. And I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. I can see at least five, six very good questions, which will probably take some time to answer and debate. Now, I think the next, we're, we're going to move to the next speaker, and then we'll have the question and answer session at the end. And it's always my pleasure, really, to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Rasha Tarif Hamza. You all know Rasha. I'm sure everybody in the audience is very familiar with the, with the name, and uh, she is really one of the best speakers, not only in Egypt, but I think in the Middle East and uh, in the Mediterranean basin in general. And uh, I have uh, known Rasha for a number of years. We shared lots of uh, committees and uh, um, and activities, and uh, we did some research uh, work together. We published one or two papers. And uh, Rasha, as you know, she is a professor of pediatric endocrinology uh, at Ain Shams University in Cairo, and she is the chair of the Education and Training Committee of the European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology. And I have to say, this is the first time for any uh, body from outside Europe to chair uh, this important committee in the SP. So we're very proud to have her chairing this committee. Uh, in addition, she is one of the founders of the Arab Society for Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes, and currently uh, she is the vice president for this society for the last uh, two years. Uh, she has been invited speaker for uh, and faculty member in various local, regional, and international conferences, as well as uh, teaching in several uh, SP as well as uh, Aspid School. Uh, Russia uh, is a key opinion leader in pediatric endocrinology, not just in Egypt or the Middle East, but I think she's uh, she's one of the key leaders in the SP as well. And uh, she sets in a number of advisory posts and editorial posts, including the Journal of Pediatric Endocrinology uh, and Metabolism. Uh, she has a lot of uh, interest in different areas of pediatric endocrinologies. Uh, I mentioned here, uh, or listed here, the growth, purity, bone, DSD, and obesity. But I can tell you that she's, she also has some interest in uh, certain aspects of diabetes as well as thyroid. And she published in all uh, these areas. She was uh, awarded the best student for SB Winter School in 2006. And again, this is, I think, the first uh, uh, student from the Middle East to uh, uh, to get this award. And uh, based on that, she, uh, she was asked to host two Winter uh, SB Winter Schools uh, in 2008 and 2018. Now, Rasha is going to talk to you about subclinical hypothyroidism, and the title of her talk will be uh, to answer the question is, should we treat these patients or not? And before we listen to uh, Rasha, I would like to take your opinion or the audience opinion on whether to treat these patients or not. And I would question here, do you think children with subclinical hypothyroidism should be treated with thyroxine? And if you think it's yes, you just press yes. If you think no, you can just press no. And if you are not sure, listen to Russia. And I think that's the, the safest answer is to say, I don't know, but it's really up to you. And I'm sure Russia will explain this in details in her talk. And then we're going to repeat this question after the, the lecture as well. So it is all you, Russia. And... Uh, Thank you, Abdelhead. Would you like to, to look at the answer? The vote answer, yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, well, only a few people said we don't know. Uh, only 15%. The majority said yes. And uh, I think nearly the third said no. I'm sure this will change after your talk, Rasha. Yeah, let's yeah, see. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's all see. All yours. Thank you. I'll try to share my screen. And please let me know if it's shared or not. I didn't ask whether my screen was shared or not. No problem. You did it very well. You don't need a screen. Is my screen shared? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you, Abdelhadi, for the very kind introduction. That's too much for me. Thank you so much. 
you're so generous. Thank you very much. Uh, and after listening to uh, Mehel's great lecture, we leave the growth hormone and let's take a taste of the thyroid gland. And you all answered the question that Abdel Hadi asked you before my talk. And let's see whether you're going to change your mind or stay as you are. Uh, I'll speak about pediatric clinical hypothyroidism and hopefully I'll try to answer the question to treat or uh, not to treat. We all know the classification of hypothyroidism, whether being primary, secondary, or subclinical hypothyroidism. And the definition of subclinical hypothyroidism is having elevated TSH with normal T4. It's usually asymptomatic in children, and therefore it is a biochemical diagnosis. When facing a child with subclinical hypothyroidism, the frequently asked questions by the parents and maybe the questions in the mind of the pediatric endocrinologist are, is it transient and will resolve? Could it progress to overt hypothyroidism? To treat or not to treat, a very difficult question. And if you decide to treat, is it a lifelong treatment or not? Now, trying to answer the question if subclinical hypothyroidism is transient or for life. About half of the cases continue as subclinical hypothyroidism, while 40%, which is a very good percent, revert to euthyroidism, and only 10% develop overt hypothyroidism. The course of subclinical hypothyroidism in childhood and adolescence differs according to the etiology. And if you look at the box on the right side, you can see that Hashimoto thyroiditis is by far the most common cause causing subclinical hypothyroidism. Some cases are idiopathic, and in between, you can see a long list of etiologies that could lead to subclinical hypothyroidism. Remember that idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism is usually self-limiting and does not require treatment. And subclinical hypothyroidism as a part of Hashimoto thyroiditis or associating autoimmune disease or chromosomal aberrations usually progresses to other type of thyroidism. And on the left side, you can see a long list in that box of drugs that could interfere with thyroid function in children and adolescents. My message is that don't forget to exclude drug intake in any child or adolescent with subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, another list of questions. The heading is, is there a long-term sequelae of subclinical hypothyroidism in children and adolescents or not? Does it affect growth? neurocognitive function, are there long-term metabolic and cardiovascular complications, and does it affect the bone mineral density or not? This is an article published in 2012 that clearly concluded that, generally speaking, subclinical hypothyroidism does not affect the general IQ, but there was an affection of the school performance in terms of attention. So it's just the attention in those children. Another interesting article published in European Journal of Endocrinology in 2011 clearly mentioned that long-term pediatric idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism does not affect the growth and cognitive function. If you look closely at the data here, you can see that height, SDS, height, velocity, SDS, and the bone, ma the bone mass index did not differ between cases with subclinical hypothyroidism and controls. Now, looking at the IQ, all aspects of IQ, whether verbal, performance, and full-scale IQ did not differ between cases with subclinical hypothyroidism, persistent cases, and controls, and the mean duration in the cases was around 3.3 years. Another study done by a Turkish group published in Pediatrics International had a different view. They clearly said that 
height improvement by L-thyroxine in subclinical hypothyroidism was clear in their data. And if you look at this figure, you can see that they found that growth velocity, SDS, improved by L-thyroxine in the pre-pubertal group and in the post-pubertal group, and they assessed that at six months and at one year. And based on that, their conclusion was that patients with short stature should be evaluated for subclinical hypothyroidism in addition to other potential causes, and that L-thyroxine treatment in these patients provides significant improvement of the height. So this paper is totally contradictory to the one I showed you before. Thyroid dysfunction raises the risk of osteoporosis and fracture, whether hypo or hyperthyroidism. And in case of hypothyroidism, the bones are brittle due to low bone turnover. This is a nice article published in Italian Journal of Pediatrics, where authors try to assess the bone health in children with long-term idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism. If you look at this table here, you can see that there was a non-significant difference regarding the calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, parathyroid hormone, and the bone mineral density Z score of the lumbar spine between cases with subclinical hypothyroidism and control. So there wasn't any difference. And they clearly concluded that bone health evaluated by lumbar spine DEXA was not impaired in children with idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism, despite long-term duration of idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism. Yet, they advised annual screening by DEXA scan. Of course, there are a lot of metabolic aspects of thyroid hormone in childhood, affecting the liver, the muscle, the adipose tissue, the heart, the blood vessel. So thyroid dysfunction affects the metabolic status. And the important question, is there any long-standing metabolic complications in children and adolescents with subclinical hypothyroidism? The answer is yes. In the post, it was mentioned that this occurs only in adults, but recently a lot of references that I'm going to show you included data about children with subclinical hypothyroidism having some metabolic complications. So what is the mechanism of cardiovascular effects in such patients? Hypertension, inflammation, dyslipidemia, hypercoagulability, endothelial dysfunction, high homocysteine, and high lipoprotein A all predispose to cardiovascular effects in those patients. Now, this is an article recently published in 2019 that evaluated cardiovascular risk factor in children with subclinical hypothyroidism. They concluded that patients with subclinical hypothyroidism had significant echo changes, especially diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle. And cardiac follow-up is useful in follow-up of children with subclinical hypothyroidism. And they clearly mentioned that further studies are needed to explore the effect of thyroxine therapy on cardiac parameters of those patients. Obesity. What about obesity? Indeed, obesity aggravates the situation. Obesity predisposes to subclinical hypothyroidism, leading to metabolic syndrome, and the vicious circle goes on. So what is the link between obesity and subclinical hypothyroidism? Or in other words, how could obesity predispose to subclinical hypothyroidism? Obesity increases the fat mass, increasing the serum leptin causing a rise in the TSH and subclinical hypothyroidism. It also increases the fat-free mass, which increases the T4 disposal, causing lowering of the T4, which causes a rise in the TSH to normalize the T4 secretion. In addition, there is increase in the free fatty acid and inflammation in obese patients, causing a degree of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome, leading to subclinical hypothyroidism, and then both lead to each other and the vicious circle goes on. This is a Danish study published in 2017, and here 
there was a comparison in the prevalence of hypothyroidism subclinical in Danish lean and obese children and adolescents. It was clear that there was a high prevalence of subclinical hypothyroidism among overweight and obese than the lean, and that central obesity, independent of the overall degree of obesity, augments the risk of concurrent subclinical hypothyroidism. These findings were supported by another recent study published in 2019 that evaluated the relationship of subclinical hypothyroidism with various components of metabolic syndrome in adolescents. And what they found is that among the components of metabolic syndrome, the risk of abdominal obesity and hypertension was higher in subclinical hypothyroidism than euthyroid subject. So indeed, there are metabolic complications. Another article published in Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health in 2018 looked at the prevalence of subclinical hypothyroidism in obese children and adolescents and correlated it to various components of metabolic syndrome. And this is what they found. There was a significant positive correlation with lipid profile, the total cholesterol, HDL, triglyceride, but it was only significant for the triglyceride. Again, is there a relation between subclinical hypothyroidism and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLUD? This paper answered the question. What they found first is that the higher the TSH, the more the left ventricular mass and index and carotid intima media thickness. And they concluded that obese adolescents with NAFLUD and subclinical hypothyroidism had a more adverse cardiovascular risk profile than those without subclinical hypothyroidism, and that thyroid dysfunction might play a role in the pathogenesis of NAFLUD. How does subclinical hypothyroidism predispose to NAFLUD or NASH? Simply, hypothyroidism increases the leptin, the FGF1, and it increases the triglycerides and cholesterol, creating a degree of hepatic insulin resistance ending by non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So you can see a lot of metabolic complications are being associated with subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, the very difficult question to treat or not to treat children with subclinical hypothyroidism, or in other way, which way shall we go? Would you like to give L-thyroxine or not? A very difficult question. In most of the references, it was clearly written that there is no clear consensus till now. Now, let's start by this case. This is an eight-year-old boy with accidentally discovered subclinical hypothyroidism. His BMI and height SDS are normal, negative family history of thyroid disease. The boy is completely asymptomatic. He does not have any goiter. His TSH was found to be high, 7.8. His free T4 is normal. Thyroid antibodies are negative and the thyroid ultrasound is normal. Now, what would you like to do for this boy? Please help me and vote with me. What would you like to do and how would you like to proceed in such a case? Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment or follow up thyroid functions after three months or no further follow-up is needed? The boy is asymptomatic and you don't want to do anything for the boy. Please help me in this. Yes, thank you very much. Most of you got the correct answer. We agree. Yes, more than 90% said follow up the thyroid function after three months. Yes, it's too early to start L-thyroxine because the boy does not have any risk factor. And I don't think it's wise to let him go home and not to look at him again. So follow up the thyroid function. Okay, now six months later, you can compare the results of that boy. All the data are nearly the same apart from a jump in the TSH. Look at the TSH, it was 7.8. When he came six months later, it was 12.2. At this point, what would you like to do for this boy? Please help me and vote. Would you like to start L-thyroxine or follow up thyroid function after three months or no further follow-up is needed? Please vote.
Yes, thank you very much. Most of you got the correct answer, more than 80%. Yes, it's wise to start thyroxine because if the TSH exceeds 10, you have to start treatment, whatever the circumstances, to avoid complications. And this is what we did with that boy. Now, another 10-year-old boy whose BMI and height were normal has got an aunt with maternal Graves' disease, has got an aunt with Graves' disease. The boy is asymptomatic. He doesn't have any problems regarding the thyroid apart from having goiter grade 2. TSH is high, 8.9. The free T4 is normal. The thyroid antibodies are positive, and the ultrasound revealed goiter with heterogeneous echo texture. What would you like to do for this boy? Please vote. Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment or follow up the thyroid function after three months or no further follow-up? The boy is asymptomatic and you don't want to do anything for that boy. Please help me. Yes, thank you very much. More than 80% got the correct answer. Of course, sometimes it's debatable, but this boy has got a lot of risk factors. He has got positive autoimmunity in his family, positive antibody, and the ultrasound showed thyroid pathology. So it's wise to start treatment in that boy. Okay, what about this seven-year-old obese girl? who has a high BMI SDS and she's very tall. Her height SDS is high. She doesn't have any family history of thyroid disease, no goiter, 3T4 is normal, TSH is high, and the antimicrosomal and antithyroglobulin antibodies are negative, and thyroid ultrasound is normal. This girl has got simple obesity. She's tall and obese. What would you like to do for this girl? Please vote. Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment or advise weight loss and follow-up thyroid functions after three months or no further follow-up is needed? Please vote. Yes, thank you very much. Most of you got the correct answer. Yes. We should advise weight loss and follow up the thyroid function after three months because as you've seen, Obesity by itself could predispose to subclinical hypothyroidism, which is reversible when weight loss occurs. And this is what happened with that girl. Look at the girl six months later. She had some weight loss, healthy lifestyle. Her BMI went down. The T4 is still normal and the TSH went down. So this was the correct answer. Advice, weight loss and follow up. And then we have a 13 and a half year old girl diagnosed as a 45 X Turner syndrome. She presented as usual with short stature and delayed puberty. And at the first visit, she had a normal T4, a high normal TSH. Thyroid antibodies at that time were negative. And the celiac screening was positive, confirmed by biopsy. Her bone age was two and a half years delayed. And as expected, she has got hypergonadotropic hypogonadism and a partial horseshoe kidney. She was put on growth hormone, Turner dose, and sex steroid as well. Now, during the regular follow-up, we found the T4 to be still normal, but the TSH went up, as you see. So she has subclinical hypothyroidism, and the antibodies turned positive, and the bone age was more delayed than before, three years delay. Now, at this point, what would you like to do for this Turner girl? Please vote with me. Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment? or follow up the thyroid functions after three months, or no further follow-up is needed. Just leave her alone. Please vote. Yes, thank you very much. We agree. Yes, we all agree together. This is a risk factor. Being a Turner syndrome is a risk factor. She has positive antibodies and the TSH is rising. So we have to treat because in syndromic cases, usually it will progress to frank hypothyroidism if not treated. Okay, now let me show you this nice article 
entitled clinical hypothyroidism in children when a replacement hormonal treatment might be advisable. And this is a recent one published in 2019. Also, it was clearly written that treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism is controversial in children. And the same question was raised when to treat a child with subclinical hypothyroidism. The answer was if high risk of progression to overt hypothyroidism. And these were the risk factors published in that paper, having thyroid pathology or hypothyroidism related subclinical hypothyroidism, while in case of idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism, no treatment is needed. It's self-limiting. If the baseline TSH is equal to or more than 10, if there is positive and rising antibodies, goiter, Turner, Down syndromes, celiac disease, or any associated autoimmunities, prepubertal at diagnosis, and female. So these are the risk factors in the red box, while the low risk is in the green box. What about the baseline TSH levels? It's the most powerful predictor for progression of subclinical hypothyroidism to overt hypothyroidism. It is recommended by most references to start thyroxine treatment for TSH levels more than 10, whatever the etiology. And increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality occurs in subclinical hypothyroid patients when the TSH is more than 10, while the treatment remains a matter of debate for TSH values between 5 and 10. What about the etiology as a predictor? As previously mentioned, idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism is usually self-limiting. We do not treat it except if the TSH exceeds 10. In hypothyroidism-related subclinical hypothyroidism, worsening of thyroid status is more frequent, especially in those with associated autoimmunities like celiac and other risk factors like syndromes and the things that we have mentioned. The treatment with LT4 in children with hypothyroidism-related subclinical hypothyroidism should not be under any debate, since the role of elevated TSH in coexisting cancer pathogenesis is possible. So if you have a definite thyroid pathology and a high TSH, it's wise to treat to avoid cancer. Now, let me share with you the guidelines for treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism proposed by the American Thyroid Association. And these were the recommendations for treating children with subclinical hypothyroidism. Again, they put the same question, to treat or not to treat a child with subclinical hypothyroidism. And the same answer was there. It's controversial in children. And what they did is that they put some criteria when to treat and when not to treat with a gray zone in between. In the green box, you can see that it's better to treat if the TSH is more than 10, if the child is symptomatic, if there is a high risk of progression to overt hypothyroidism, and we have already mentioned the risk factors before. When not to treat, do not treat if the TSH ranges from 5 to 10 plus negative antibodies, idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism, if there is no goiter, if the child is asymptomatic, and if there is no thyroid pathology by ultrasound. And in such a case, you just follow up the thyroid functions every three to six months. When stable, you follow up annually. Now, the most difficult part is the gray zone. And what they wrote is to consider treatment. If the TSH is two times the upper limit or more than eight, if there is a progressive rise in the TSH, positive antibodies, goiter, if there's a child or adolescent with short stature, dyslipidemia and cardiovascular risk factors or disease, and if you find a thyroid pathology by ultrasound. And this is the most difficult part in such cases. And here you have to balance things and to treat on individual basis. And this is the most difficult really. So there are some pros and cons of treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism in children. There are some potential benefits like improvement in mild symptoms and the lipid profile only if the TSH is more than 10 and prevention of overt hypothyroidism, especially if antibodies are positive or associated thyroid pathology. What about the drawbacks? The symptoms improve and the lipids improve. It's unusual if the TSH is from 5 to 10. Potential for overtreating patients. 
40% revert to normal thyroid function without treatment. And this is a very good percent and the expense of lifelong medication. So as you see, there are benefits and drawbacks. Again, you have to balance the pros and the cons. And there are some tips to remember when treating children with subclinical hypothyroidism. Remember to start with a very small thyroxine dose to avoid side effects. And the recommended dose is 25 to 50 micrograms a day. And I would go more with the 25. Adjust the dose in 12 and a half up to 25 increase or decrease according to the situation. Reassess the 3T4 and TSH after four to six weeks and then every three months until the patient is stable. And then you follow up the thyroid functions every three to six months until reverts to you, thyroidism, and then annually if the antibodies turn positive and every three years if the antibodies are negative. Now, this slide sums up all what we have said. What is the pediatric workup for patients with pediatric subclinical hypothyroidism? Measure the free T4 and TSH, thyroid antibodies, thyroid ultrasound, assess for symptoms, goiter, and complications, ask about the family history of thyroid disease, don't forget to exclude medications, obesity, thyroid dysgenesis, adrenal insufficiency, syndromic causes, and renal failure. Let me show you this 10-year-old girl who developed a midline neck swelling that was noticed at the age of two years. It was gradually increasing in size. By examination, it was soft, cystic, and not tender. The swelling moves on swallowing and protrusion of the tongue. There was no pain or discharge, no lymphadenopathy, and apart from the swelling, the girl is totally asymptomatic. Now, thyroid function tests were done because she has a neck swelling. And what we found is that there was a subclinical hypothyroidism, as you see the labs, a TSH being high, T4 normal, and the antibodies were negative. Because she has a cystic swelling, we also asked for neck ultrasound. We found a multi-septated anechoic cystic lesion, and the thyroid gland was not visualized in the thyroid fossa. Now, what is the next step in that girl? We cannot see the thyroid. There is a cystic swelling by ultrasound. What would you like me to do? Please vote with me and help me in this girl. Would you like to repeat the thyroid ultrasound after three months? Or repeat the thyroid functions after three months? Or would you like to do a thyroid scan? What's the next step in that girl? Thank you very much. Yes, nearly 90% got the correct answer. Yes, whenever you cannot see the thyroid gland by ultrasound, we must do a thyroid scan to see whether it's ectopic or in any uh, abnormal uh, place. Okay, and these were the results of the thyroid scan in that girl. There was ectopic thyroid tissue anterior to the hyoid and Inside the thyroglossal cyst, there was absent uptake in the normal thyroid bed. So the ectopia was in the hyoid and inside the thyroglossal cyst. And this was confirmed by CT. And remember that there is a risk of carcinoma when there is ectopic thyroid inside the thyroglossal cyst. Only 1%, but it's there. So the diagnosis here is ectopic thyroid gland in thyroglossal cyst and infrahyoid. What is your suggested management of that girl? Please help me again. What would you like to do? Would you like to do surgical excision of the thyroglossal cyst and start L-thyroxine treatment? Or follow up the thyroid functions and ultrasound again after three months? Or there is no need for surgery. Let's go and start L-thyroxine treatment. Please vote. Yes, thank you very much. More than 85% got the correct answer. Yes, it's very important to remove the thyroglossal cyst because infection could be super added on the cyst. And as we said, inside there is ectopic thyroid that could turn malignant. After the surgery, we start L-thyroxine treatment and this is what we did with that girl. In infants, the situation is critical. Take care not to slip. 
This is an eight day old neonate who had uneventful birth history, normal birth weight and length. The baby was totally asymptomatic, but the TSH on neonatal screening was high, 14. At this point, what would you like to do for this neonate? Please vote. Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment because the TSH is high or repeat the thyroid functions after two weeks and do a thyroid ultrasound or as long as the baby is not symptomatic, there is no further follow-up is needed. Let the baby go home. What would you like to do? Please choose and help me in this neonate. Yes, thank you very much. Again, most of you got the correct answer. Yes, we have to follow up the thyroid functions and do a thyroid ultrasound. Of course, we cannot let him go home. And I think we need to wait on the L-thyroxine treatment. There is no rush. Now, this is the European Society for Pediatric Endocrinology consensus guidelines on screening, diagnosis, and management of congenital hypothyroidism. And here, if you have a baby or a neonate with hyperthyroid troponemia at the neonatal screening, if the TSH is more than 40, you must start treatment and do thyroid imaging. If less than 40, do venous thyroid blood sampling. If the free T4 is below the normal range or the TSH is above 20, even with the normal T4, again, you have to start treatment and do imaging. Remember that thyroid scan is mandatory if you cannot see the thyroid gland by ultrasound to exclude ectopia. And then we have the gray zone, like the neonate that I showed you. If the TSH is from six to 20, retest the thyroid functions after two weeks and do thyroid imaging by ultrasound and or the scan. So these are the guidelines by European Society for Pediatric Endocrine. Now, let me show you what happened in that baby two weeks later. The baby is still asymptomatic, but the TSH jumped to 22, and the thyroid ultrasound revealed right thyroid lobe hemiagenesis. What would you like to do for this baby at this point? Please vote. Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment or follow up the thyroid functions after another two weeks and repeat the thyroid ultrasound or no further follow-up is needed? Please vote. Yes, I totally agree. We have to stop treatment because TSH exceeded 20 and there is definite hemiagenesis seen by ultrasound. So yes, this is the correct answer. So this is the gray zone and the decision of treatment is controversial in such gray zone cases. In infants with mild subclinical hypothyroidism, the good news is that 72% resolve spontaneously. And the indication of treatment of infants with subclinical hypothyroidism are if the TSH is persistently high, more than 10 for more than three to four weeks, or symptoms suggestive of hypothyroidism, or if there is a definite thyroid dysgenesis like thyroid ectopia, because in such cases, there are concerns about neurodevelopment and growth. So it's very important to judge the situation properly. These are the doses to start with until after the age of 16. And remember that we keep the serum TSH in the age-specific normal range, and the serum T4, 3T4 should be maintained in the upper half of the age-specific normal range. This is very important. What about re-evaluation of the thyroid axis at the age of three years and retesting after stopping the treatment? Usually, we try to stop at the age of three and we re-evaluate. But remember that re-evaluation of the thyroid axis is not indicated when. Thyroid dysgenesis is conclusively shown by imaging. Or if dyshormonogenesis is confirmed by molecular genetic testing, or if you have a progressive rise in the TSH and you need to increase the dose of thyroxine, of course, you cannot stop and do the retesting. My last case is this 14-year-old girl with chronic kidney disease since four years. She's on regular hemodialysis. Regarding the thyroid, she's asymptomatic, but she has goiter grade two. Her TSH is high, 8.2. Her free T3 and T4 are normal. The antibodies are negative and thyroid ultrasound revealed enlarged thyroid gland with no definite pathology there. 
So the girl has got subclinical hypothyroidism associating chronic kidney disease. What is the next step in such a girl? We have a girl with chronic kidney disease and subclinical hypothyroidism. What would you like to do in such a girl? Would you like to start L-thyroxine treatment or follow up the thyroid functions after two to three months or no further follow-up is needed? This is a bit of a difficult question. Would you like to treat patients with chronic kidney disease and subclinical hypothyroidism or just wait? The TSH is 8.2. Okay, 60% would like to start L-thyroxine and nearly 40% would like to wait and follow up the thyroid function. And only one said no further follow-up is needed. Indeed, we need to follow up the case because she has got a problem and the TSH is high, so we must follow up the case. And I think that this is a bit debatable whether to treat or not. Some would like to treat, but it's a bit dangerous to give, especially if you start with high doses, but I prefer not treating cases when the TSH did not exceed 10, because this is part of the compensatory mechanism that happens in cases with chronic renal failure. So subclinical hypothyroidism in chronic kidney disease to treat or not to treat, again, lack of consensus whether to treat subclinical hypothyroidism in chronic kidney disease or not. Attempts at unnecessary thyroid hormone replacement in asymptomatic cases increases the muscle catabolism and causes a negative nitrogen balance. So we have to be very careful not to overtreat such patients because the subclinical hypothyroidism, as I mentioned, is a part of compensatory mechanism in such cases. Most of references agreed that there's no need to treat subclinical hypothyroidism in patients with chronic kidney disease if the TSH is less than 10, except if the patient is symptomatic. And if you decide to treat, start with very low doses of thyroxine and monitor the cardiac function and look for arrhythmia. Again, another article published in JCM supported that and mentioned a cutoff of TSH being more than 10 proposed in order to start treatment in patients with chronic kidney disease. My final conclusions are, Subclinical hypothyroidism is less common in children than adults. Generally speaking, most of pediatric subclinical hypothyroid cases resolve spontaneously, 40%, a very good percent. Decision of treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism in children is highly controversial, and this was mentioned by most guidelines and references. Children with a TSH of more than 10 must be treated, whatever the etiology, even if idiopathic. Children with a TSH of 5 to 10 are treated on an individual basis based on the risk factors. Children with idiopathic subclinical hypothyroidism are usually self-limiting and resolve spontaneously. Don't rush to treat them except if the TSH exceeds 10. Children with hypothyroid-related subclinical hypothyroidism or a definite thyroid pathology usually require treatment and follow-up because they will usually go to overt hypothyroidism. And remember that obesity-related subclinical hypothyroidism needs follow-up and weight loss is recommended. Again, don't rush to treat obese children with subclinical hypothyroidism. Let them lose weight and reassess the TSH. It will go down. And finally, infants with borderline TSH levels need a close follow-up. Repeat the TSH again and do an ultrasound and Accordingly, you can decide on the treatment. This was a very complicated algorithm that I found when looking into subclinical hypothyroidism, summing up all what I have said. I hope I was able to simplify it a little bit because it's a really difficult area. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sasha. You certainly simplified. And uh, uh, thank you very much for this elegant talk, which combined the art and science. Uh, I think there are lots of questions. I'm trying to share screen again, so to avoid what happened early. And as promised, I will start, before going to the question, I will ask you the same question again which I Abdel Hedi, can you put the slideshow, please? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do. So it's so... Uh, yes, it's done now. Yes. Yeah. Good. I mean, before this, this is what 
I already said about Russia. I think there, there are lots of things written here, so I can send you the slide if you want. But sorry for not being able to share the screen. Now, this is the question I asked you before Russia spoke. And I wrote here the percentage of uh, people's answer. So do you think children with subclinical hypothyroidism should be treated with thyroxine or not? Or you still don't know? So please vote now. And then we will move to the question and answer question, just to see whether there is any difference really between the initial uh, answers and the post lecture answer. People taking a lot of time thinking, isn't it? Yeah, it's very controversial indeed. <laughs> I think the last slide made it very easy. <laughs> And you have a look at the results? Yeah, well. OK, yes. Yeah, so the some... no's are more than the yeses. Yeah, and there was also a swing on people who selected I don't know. There were 10% or less than 10% initially. Now I think you confused them more, Russia. <laughs> so we got nearly 20% were saying we don't know. And instead of 60%, we said yes and dropped down to 40%. Now, uh, we will move directly to the... Uh, a question and answer session, and I think I'll just go to the to the screen. I don't know if you can see my screen now, or yes, we can see it. You can just uh, pass press on the button; it will end. Yeah, I don't think I need to. I yes, need to fine now. Yeah, right. So uh, there are lots of questions, and uh, some of them really on the first lecture of growth hormone deficiency, others on the cynical hypothyroidism. There are two general questions which I'm going to address. The first one is, uh, well, is there any record for this presentation and, or for the whole yes. webinar? And I, I think yes. the answer is yes. And there's another question asking whether the attendees will have a certificate. And I think I've already answered this question in the introduction. And the answer is yes. If you finish the question and answer session, uh, then you will have a certificate emailed to you, hopefully, within the next 48 hours. Now, there is a question uh, linking the two talks together. And this question says, can we depend on growth hormone assay for a child with untreated subclinical hypothyroidism? Now, I will let Mehl try to answer it first, and then we will hear from Russia. So I think, yeah, I mean, I would not rely on the growth hormone measurements in a child with abnormal thyroid function tests generally. Uh, now, if it's very mild subclinical, um, you, one's got to be a little bit careful because some patients with hyperpituitism also have a slightly elevated TSH with a low normal thyroxine. Yeah. And they may turn out to be genuinely growth hormone deficient. So I think it's in the context, really. But most of the time, I'd like to know that the thyroid function is normal yeah. before we test growth hormone, the growth hormone axis. Thank you. Russia, what do you think? Yes, I totally agree with Mehal. I feel comfortable if the thyroid function is totally normal. Even if there is mild elevation in the TSH, I'm not comfortable with doing growth hormone stimulation test. I think it could give a lot of false positive results in growth hormone stimulation. So better make sure that the thyroid is very good and then go for the growth hormone stimulation. Thank you. Thank you very much for both of you. And thank you also for the for the uh, the, the doctor who asked the question. It's a very nice question. Dr. Yeah. Dawood Abdoun, I can read his name. Right. The next question is... Uh, I think it's a general question. What are the indication of growth hormone provocation test? Just quick answer from uh, Mehul and then Rasha, if she wants to add something. So I, I think a child who's failing to grow and you've excluded all other causes, um, such as chronic renal failure, etc., hypothyroidism, as we've heard, and then you would probably, um, and, and I, I always like to see a low or low normal IGF-1 as well before I embark on a growth hormone stimulation test. Anything to add, Rasha? Nothing. Perfect. Nothing Good. to add. Yeah, I'm just going one by one here. How to interpret a growth hormone provocation test. I think it is 
it's really yeah. it needs, it needs a lecture on its own, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think yeah. if you would, uh, you have to go to the room together. You probably need them in there for about four or five days, and you still wouldn't get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, it's a combination. I think it's not just a growth hormone provocation test, but it's also, as I've discussed, things like the MRI, IGF one, and oxology. Important. Yeah, we'll stay, we'll stay yeah. with the growth. We we'll stay with the growth, and uh, there's a, a question from Professor Mona Salen. Thank you very much for the elegant talk. Uh, I like to know if you have any experience with long-acting growth hormone uh, since it's been approved in China and Korea. That's probably before the COVID-19, I think. So, yeah. so we've just been involved on a study basis so far, and none of the indicate uh, none of the preparations are approved for use in children as yet in the in Europe and the UK. So just on a study basis so far. Yeah. Any anything to add, Russia? No, nothing to add. Yes, it's all clinical trials. That it's not yet a drug there in the market to use like the, the already growth hormone that we have. What is what's the difficulty? Why it is taking long time? I think I think the the first trial went on when I was in training long time ago, and yeah. I don't know why it's really uh, being too slow. Any thoughts? So many of the operations didn't really meet the criteria of sort of. Uh, you know, improvement on existing sort of data in terms of growth rate, et cetera. So the criteria were quite stringent, or at least at least meeting similar growth rates to daily growth horns. So quite a few of the companies have not managed to show that. Uh, the Nova preparation now has been approved for use in adults. The studies are still going on in the pediatric population. They're hoping to get approval fairly soon. Mm, for pediatrics. For the pediatrics. Good. Yeah, but it's still uh, two years away from what I gather. And with the COVID, God knows. <laughs> yeah, the COVID is... Well, it gives you more time to, to do research, I suppose. I think yeah. it's, exactly. it's, it will, be, uh, will be quicker in this aspect. Right, there's, there's also uh, a tricky question from Dr. Shaima Sayed, and I think I'll probably ask you, Russia, because you are an expert in Turner. Is abnormal differential growth of limbs rather than trunk is considered one of the side effects of growth hormone, especially in Turner syndrome. What do you think? Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, I would say that Turner by themselves, even before starting growth hormone, have got a sort of disproportionality due to shocks mm -hmm. affection. But I don't think that growth hormone would worsen this. They already have this proportion from the beginning. And I'd yeah. like to hear what Mehel thinks. Completely agree. I mean, I think it's, a, it's it, it, in the simplest terms, it's a skeletal dysplasia. Yeah. Secondary to shocks deficiency. And I think, you know, growth hormone we know is of benefit, but there's no evidence to suggest that actually it increases the disproportion that's already there. Yeah. Yeah. Another question uh, on the relationship between growth hormone therapy and school performance. I had many patients, it's, uh, again, Dr. Dawood Abdon, I had many patients on growth hormone treatment. Uh, complain of uh, decreased school performance and impaired memory with normal thyroid function test. So it's not subclinical hypothyroidism. Is there any relationship? That was the question. It's not my question. So, okay, so that's actually quite the opposite of what I often find because <laughs> I find that a lot of children who start on growth and suddenly do a lot better in terms of not only school performance, ge the general motor development as one would expect. And in fact, it's data I wanted to show, but I didn't have time, is that we've shown that actually untreated growth hormone deficiency compared to children with idiopathic short stature is associated with a 10 point difference in IQ. Yeah. And also in a certain uh, development of certain areas of the brain uh, some of the uh, nerve tracts, basically. So, you know, these are difficult studies to perform. But for me, I think, you know, when, when we start with them, I often see some amazing improvements in performance. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what is the maximum dose of growth hormone in units that can be injected daily? So I, I, I guess the sky's the limit depending on the IGF-1. And whatever you use to titrate it. I mean, obviously, you have to stick within the recommendations for each um, uh, indication, uh, you know, 20 to 30 for uh, for GHD or up to 35. 
Turner syndrome, higher doses up to uh, nearly 50 micrograms per kilogram per day. So I think you would stick with the indications, but also IGF-1 and the growth rate, but also remember adherence as well. So it's easy to keep going up on the dose thinking, you know, they're not responding, but actually they may not be taking it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Russia, any experience with a very high growth hormone dose? Uh, you mean in the neonates? No, it is just any age. As Mehul said, yes, you can go up as long as the IGF-1 is fine. The IGF-1 SDS is going fine and according to the indication as well. The Turner is different from a growth hormone deficient, for example. Yeah, I mean, all, all the thyroid questions came at the end. So let me finish the... the, uh, <laughs> the finish the, the growth hormone first. Yeah, the growth hormone first, and then uh, you, you will both going to answer the thyroid as well. Uh, because I think it's an area of overlap. I don't think that you can really separate them. Uh, very vividly. So uh, there are two questions about the risk of growth hormone, one on neurofibromatosis and the other one on renal transplant patient, neurofibromatosis. Uh, we've got a world expert on neurofibromatosis, uh, sorry, craniopharyngioma, that's one, but neurofibromatosis is also one of your areas, male. Go so on. I think, I think in neurofibromatosis, if you've shown that the child is growth hormone deficient, yeah. And you screen them for uh, things like optic lyomas, et cetera, then I think you can start growth hormone, but I always start at a low dose, monitor the IGF-1, <clears throat> find the IGF-1 around the mean or plus one SDS, but no higher. So if you use it safely uh, in a child that is actually growth hormone deficient, I would be quite happy to do that with careful monitoring. Asha, any comments? No, I, I'd like to ask Mehal, and what about the dose, Mehal, in neurofibromatosis? Is it just the growth hormone deficiency dose? Yes. And you increase according to the response, the growth velocity? To the growth yeah. velocity in the IGF-1. Yeah, yeah. But I start with the GHD dose first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other question is about the risk of growth hormone therapy in patients with renal trans risk of rejection in renal transplant patient. I thought if you go to renal transplant, you, you don't need the growth hormone therapy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... It's not approved, I, yeah, yes. Exactly, Sorry. yeah, that's right. Yeah, you stop it. I mean, what, you, you can use it in CKD, but once you mm -hmm. go to the transplant, you don't need it anymore. Yeah, that's right. right. Uh, is hypoglycemia in GHD can occur in older children? So it's very unusual. I've hardly ever seen isolated GHD uh, presenting with hypoglycemia in older children. There's usually short stature. But in the first three years of life, it's quite common. Okay. Any comments, Russia? No, thank you. Uh, which age is appropriate for starting the treatment with the growth hormone in suspicions of growth hormone or GFD? I don't know what's the meaning of GFD, to be honest. Growth hormone insufficiency, maybe growth hormone deficiency? Uh, maybe, what, maybe a growth hormone deficiency, yes. Yeah. What yeah. examination would you perform by a general pediatrician before referring to specialist endocrinology? Yeah, that's that's easy. So what yeah. would you do, Russia, for example, before okay. you refer, or what would you advise the general pediatrician? We've got, we got nearly 30% of our audience are, as general pediatrician. Yeah, yeah. very so, respectable number. Yeah, yes. so, so what would you advise them? GP. The basic, the basic, doing the basic thing, measuring the height accurately, plotting the height on the growth chart, calculating the midparental height, and seeing if the child lies within the midparental height range or not. Looking at the puberty if the child is more than ten years, and then going for the mm -hmm. tests. And please start by the baseline investigations. Don't jump to endocrine testing and do a growth hormone stimulation test from the beginning. And of course, if a short girl, carry type. And don't forget to exclude celiac disease as well, because there is silent celiac, which presents with short stature with no clear GIT symptoms. This is the summary. Mehal, would you like to add anything? No, I completely agree. I think sometimes I, I would add probably a bone age as well as I find quite useful. Yeah. And if they yeah. can get access to an IGF one, that's always handy. Yeah. yeah. In cases of short stature with obesity ah. or assessment of a growth hormone, <laughs> do we do growth hormone provocation tests or just IGF-1? No, I think I think you do the combination. And I think the important thing is the growth rate as well. Yeah. The growth rate, growth hormone test, and IGF-1. Not easy, 
But if the IGF one is completely normal, then be careful and don't yeah. start unless you're absolutely sure. Yeah. Yeah, another question is just asking whether we can use ex exercise in uh, instead of pharmacological provocation test. Afraid not, because it just doesn't give very reproducible and validated results. Yeah, it's close yeah. possible. Yeah, the other question is, is that this really very commonly asked question is whether growth hormone deficiency is possible if you got IGF-1 or if you got a normal IGF-1? So, yes, I mean, I think, you you know, it's unusual, but yes, it could be, especially in children who've had tumours and treatment for it. Um, you know, the IGF-1 may be low normal or within the normal range. Uh, so I think it is possible, but it's unusual. Uh, there's other question to Dr. to Russia. Uh, I think the... the uh, and the the question is I they were asking about the new nate waiting they said they don't agree with Dr. Russia's for new nate to wait for two weeks before starting a treatment. I don't think that's what you said, but uh, I don't know if you if you want to make any comment on that. Uh, it's not my it's not mine. This is the SV guidelines. <laughs> uh, if the TSH exceeds twenty you treat less than twenty, there is more than seventy percent incidence or chance of resolving unless there is a definite pathology in the thyroid. So in the neonate that I presented, the TSH was 14. The baby is asymptomatic. So there is no harm of repeating after two weeks. If you want to make sure at this point you do an ultrasound from the beginning, if there is no thyroid pathology and the TSH did not exceed 20, we wait because it could resolve. If it exceeds 20 or T4 is low, we treat. Yeah. I think, I think that probably the uh, the the the, uh, the person who asked the question didn't follow the number. Yeah, Please. yeah, and and let me tell you that there is a general concept: people being terrified, the general pediatrician terrified of hypothyroidism, the mental retardation, the growth failure. They treat at very low TSH level. They treat at ten in neonate, at twelve. Yes, this happens really because people and the parents are terrified and the doctors are terrified. But actually, nothing will happen in two weeks except that the TSH exceeds 20. Lots of appraisal and thanks to the speakers. Uh, amazing presentation, Dr. Rasha, as usual. My question, is it mandatory to treat subclinical hypothyroidism in every child with Down syndrome, even if the TSH is less than 10? Okay, it's tricky. Uh, again, you have to put to fit the pieces together. For example, if you have a TSH of 5.5 or 6, the antibodies are not high, the child is growing well, I would not treat. But if the TSH is rising, the antibodies started to be positive, some symptoms you treat, so it's a matter of balance. It could be a gray zone. It's not a yes and a no. The only big yes is if the TSH exceeds 10. Yeah, but he's asking, the question is asking specifically about Down syndrome. What's written is that it's better to treat this way, better to treat. It's not a direct yes you must treat. It's better to treat in syndromic and chromosomal cases, what especially think, if the antibody is positive. What do you think, male, as a as a clinician? So sorry, I missed that last point. That it's Down syndrome with a yes. TSH yeah. with a high TSH but less than ten. No, I mean I think I have a low threshold for starting in in Down syndrome. You will wait, huh? Sorry? And, what, and what if you have positive antibodies? A down with TSH-8, for example, and positive no, antibodies? No, I would start. I would start. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. I think Mayon's saying he has a low threshold to start. Yes, I would start yeah. quite e much more easily in Down syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is a long uh, case here, a long question. I tried to read it, but I think I'll probably go through the shorter questions, and then I'll come back to this if we've got time. Uh, convulsion after starting... Thyroxine treatment in few infant? Is this something you experience? I, I haven't don't... seen it. For me, I haven't seen it. No. Mayhul? No, I've not seen that. I mean, sometimes anticonvulsants can lead to abnormal thyroid function. Yeah, yeah. And then if you start treatment then, no, the fits would be unrelated. So I yeah. don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think there are parents asking about their son. They said the we are parents, 183 and 173, so they are tall parents with a 14-year-old uh, boy who is 162 centimeter. He entered puberty in the last two months. 
he is very active playing tennis and uh, without exception always the shortest and the highest and the lightest among his peers uh, we we had a run or we have run blood tests with no obvious issues no visible signs of growth hormone deficiency i think if he is 14 and 162 is unlikely uh, okay. born age one year younger we live in croatia oh that's very interesting yeah. we've been unsuccessful in locating a specialist pediatric endocrinology in croatia we are concerned should we treat thank you or should we should you would you advise them to visit cairo or london or what what would you start say? start by london what do you think Mel? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's likely to be absolutely fine i mean he's already 162 if yeah. he's just started puberty and if he's got a bone age delay of one year he's got another three years of growth uh, which will include a growth spurt um yeah. so i think he'll be fine yeah what do you yeah. think Rashid? Like I, I, I totally agree. There could be a, a bit of constitutional element. I won't say constitutional delay in growth and puberty, but maybe there is a touch of constitutional element because he, he will catch up. I think so. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing is, the reassuring thing is he's 14 and just started the puberty, so he still has... Uh, yeah, he will uh, He will catch up. Way to go, yeah. What is the best timing of giving thyroxine in patients with hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, so that it will not be affected by the dialysis. Very big question. What do you think, Russia? I think I, I, I could put the number 10 again to get out of this. I mean, if the TSH exceeds 10, you start with a very low dose. If the patient is not symptomatic, I would wait. I don't know what Mehel thinks. I think the question they're asking about the timing. The timing of giving thyroxine in patients. Ah, okay, not the cutoff. Peritoneal paralysis. No, the, the time. Would you give it before the dialysis, after the dialysis? This is how I understood it from the question. Ah, okay. I didn't catch it this way. I thought they mean the TSH level. Yeah. Uh, I think after. But this is my own thinking because it's not something clear, written clearly when to give it. But I think would be after. What do you I think, Mel? I think that makes common. That's common. Uh, ma makes more common sense, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, you've done the dialysis and then you can give it after that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think the problem is with the hemodialysis because you, do, you just do it two or three times a week, then you can give it any time afterwards. The problem with the peritoneal, because it's a daily event and yeah. they do it at home, it will be a little bit tricky. I don't think. Uh, but uh, I think it's wise to give it after, as Mehul said, by common sense. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, brilliant professors, both very nice, interesting lectures. Uh, is congenital hypothyroidism or incongenital hypothyroidism is there is ectop ectopia scan is ectopia scan should be done i don't know this is how it's written maybe they mean thyroid scan uh, for uh, ectopic yeah isotope yeah isotope yeah. but yeah. it's a, it's maybe the keyboard just put it this way yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you think do you support doing scan on every child with congenital hypothyroidism I do it only if the thyroid is not seen by ultrasound. This is what I do. And Mehul, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I do the same. I, mean, I suppose the only thing is if you're suspecting some, some sort of an inborn error and you want to show increased uptake or whatever. Yeah. But otherwise, I agree that if you usually, if you can't see it easily on the ultrasound, an ultrasound would be a good screen. Okay, so there's no need to, to scan everybody. Yeah. Now, yeah, there's another. Yeah, and, and can I add a practical point, Abdel Hadi? We cannot do the thyroid scan while the baby is on thyroxine. Yeah. We have yeah. to stop it to, for three weeks. And this is another thing because some babies already start the treatment and they come saying, okay, shall we do the thyroid scan now? I will not take the risk of stopping the treatment just to do a thyroid scan if the ultrasound data is sufficient for me. Yeah, I think, I think some people uh, who, who run some research in thyroid, they usually do. The scan before starting the thyroid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, genital hypothyroidism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, this is not a practical. This is not a practical thing to do in in daily basis. Now, uh, now there is a new insight to consider that free T T4 is an ideal parameter for the diagnosis of any thyroid disorder. Do you agree with that? Alone or in combination with TSH? Uh, I think I think it is. It's probably just check what the what the uh, the uh, 
the question is alluded to is maybe just to check free thyroxine and this is an ideal. This is enough. Uh, no, for me well, it's not enough need, because if it's subclinical, it will be normal at a time. Yeah, agreed completely. You need yeah, to... I mean, there are, and also there are there are cases where you really need to check free T4, uh, free T3, sorry. To uh, yeah. like uh, to uh, to reach a diagnosis. Yeah, I, I think maybe uh, what he means is that in cases of central hypothyroidism, we follow up using the free T4 rather than the TSH. Maybe this is what he means. This is the, very important. Yes, in central hypothyroidism, no need to to use the TSH later on the follow-ups. We just rely on the free T4. For example, a child with craniopharyngioma, for example, yes, you can follow up with the free T4 or any other secondary cases. Yeah, I think what's, what, what, what the, the question is saying is, can you use free T4 as an I for the diagnosis of any thyroid disorder? Alone, no, I wouldn't. Alone, no. Yeah. yeah. So I got somebody thanking me as well. Thank you. Thank you for this elegant webinar. Male boy, 12-year-old with goiter. I don't know what's the question. But further to our question, yeah, these are the parents are coming back. <laughs> No, no, he is in minus three or something like this. Further to our question, our son was on the 90th percentile when he was two year old. Now he is on minus three uh, percentile. Could this potentially be a growth hormone deficiency? I think they are Paul, Paul Cassila. I think they're the same parents, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it could That's be, it. but it's also quite common to see a deceleration. Yeah. Uh, or, or, you know, dropping, changing centiles in the first two to three years of life. So really the important thing is to monitor quite carefully. And then if it persists, then to do the usual screening investigations and then follow on after that. Yeah. But the strange thing, Mehal, about this case is that it started at the 90th. He's tall. He's not even normal. He's tall. I think this is a bit strange depends, for me. Yeah. And it depends on what the, how tall the parents are as well, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, for the parents. Adjustment. Yeah. 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 That's another question. Subclinical hypothyroidism. What do you think about these patients who persist to have the same lab result despite long term follow up? Which lab the result? You mean less than 10 or, or more than 10? Yeah, there, there's, no, there, there's no really specification. They just subclinical hypothyroidism. And presumably, high, T, high TSH, normal T4. Okay, if, if we say, if the TSH is above 10, definitely we will treat. I will not wait for it to rise. If the TSH is from 5 to 10, we will look for the risk factors. If there aren't any risk factors and the TSH is the same and not rising, I would wait. But again, it's on individual basis. There's another, uh, another question about subclinical hypothyroidism in preterm low birth weight babies. I think it needs a lecture on its own. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, they, they, they could, they, this is just a comment rather than a question, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question about back to growth hormone deficiency. Is MRI mandatory for all patients with growth hormone deficiency, even if other pituitary hormone are normal? Yes, I mean, I think there's no doubt in my mind, um, because we find quite a lot of the children have structural abnormalities of the pituitary. The important thing is that if you know about that, then these children are at risk of developing other hormone deficiencies with time. Yeah. And so then that raises your antennae to, for that, and you just keep a closer eye on those children. <clears throat> so I would say yes. And obviously, you may pick up a tumor as well. So I think it's important yeah. to do that. Yeah. Do you agree, Russia? Yeah, totally agree. Do you think, do you do... MRI on all your patients with, with growth hormone deficiency? I don't do it for all my patients because there are some economical aspects here. But if you're speaking ideally, if I have the ledger to do it for every patient, I would do it because you will catch things that you couldn't, that, that you could lose if you don't do the MRI. But yeah, I, I, I specifically, I don't do it for every patient. I think it's important in the transition. I mean, yeah. if, you, if, you get, if you get a normal MRI, then they're likely to, uh, to need a growth Continue. hormone. Continue. Yeah, to continue. Right, there's another question here on growth hormone. Growth hormone treatment produces subclinical hypothyroidism. I'm not sure about this. I don't know what's the meaning of this. Is it in maybe the... maybe what they mean is that it unmasks it unmasks. Maybe this is uh, what they mean. 
it unmasks hypothyroidism. What do you think, Mehan? I mean, you do pick it up. So, you, you, you know, the question is whether it's related to the growth of one treatment or whether this child was going to get hypothyroidism anyway. Yeah. And that's difficult to tease out, tease out. I mean, there's no doubt about cortisol, and it does unmask cortisol deficiency um, because of its effects on 11 beta HSD and increasing cortisol clearance. But thyroid is a little bit more iffy, and, and you know, whether these children were likely to get it, and you're just seeing that yeah. as the next evolution. Yeah. It is uh, a question on another point, which we already touched upon. Um, is there a maximum total daily dose per, uh, for growth hormone to be given uh, when you say growth hormone is not working and we should stop it? I don't know. It's uh, That's a very good point. And it brings us back to the original question. I think one's got to think about the IGF-1. One's got to think about the growth rate. Mm. And if you've optimized both of those and the child's still not growing, then think about adherence as well. Mm. Uh, and really, if, if you find that, you know, once you've optimized everything, you're convinced that the child is adhering to treatment and it's not doing much, then you stop it. And I think that's quite important to sort of actually think about it as you go along and not just stick them on it for life. Yeah, yeah. yeah there is. Yeah, what yeah. do you think, Sasha? Anything you want uh, to add? Uh, I just, I need to ask Mel, it comments. And do you sometimes stop the growth removal for a while, three months, for example, and restart again, and you find a better response? Or when you decide to stop it, then it's, that's it. What do you do? Or according to different, sometimes the turner, for example, do not grow. You keep yeah. increasing and increasing, and the waning effect, you cannot just tolerate the waning effect. What would you like to do in such cases? So sometimes I think it's, it's you know, once they get into puberty and if, if they're not growing and you go into puberty and you then start growth hormone, they will respond better at that time. OK, but generally, I mean, I think when we stop, we usually completely stop at that point and then monitor the growth and the IGF-1 off it. Now, if the IGF-1 drops again, then that's a different matter. But there's a lot in, uh, in Europe now. There's a lot of interest in actually stopping, as I said, in early puberty and looking to see if they are reversing at that point. Yeah, so yeah. transition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we'll say with the response, there's a question of, of whether changing between growth hormone formulation may affect response. So, I mean, I think it's a, that's a difficult question. I'm going to be quite careful about the answer here. Yeah. But there are devices that are good and so there's two things one is yes i mean it depends on how much choice you give the young person before you start them on growth hormone. And i think there's plenty of evidence out there that if they do have a re really reasonable choice and they are in engaged in the picking <clears throat> the device they will do better but the other thing is there's also sometimes devices that help you monitor how many doses they're taking mm -hmm. and that might act as like a little policeman really so that can improve compliance and adherence as well yeah any then, comments, Russia? Yeah, the the ones uh, needle freeze as well. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yes, yes, I agree. Compliance is a very good point to to mention. And sometimes parents do not say it easily unless you keep pressing and pressing. So if you have a device telling you this easily, it would be great. Yeah. Because there is a high percentage of lack of response due to poor compliance. You're not advertising for a specific device here, are you? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> we don't have it now in Egypt. <laughs> right, okay. It's, 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 not not it's not the same this product anyway. So, right. When to stop growth hormone in young adolescents uh, with growth hormone deficiency was treated by growth hormone deficiency due to hypoglycemia in infancy and his height is normal and achieved normal puberty. And so it's basically they're saying... Uh, and asymptomatic, I think it's related. You already mentioned that in the transition uh, slides, but uh, you can, if you can just reiterate on that. So what, when do you stop growth hormone or? Yeah, yeah, this is a young, a young man who's in growth, growth hormone deficient, reached adult height, uh, reached puberty. Would you continue or not? That's the question. So, so once they've reached adult height, then we give them a pause off growth hormone treatment and retest them. So then if they fail the growth hormone test and the criteria are less than three micrograms per liter yeah. in the UK and Europe, 
then uh, you offer them the choice of whether they continue or not. Quite a lot say no, they want to stay off it. And then you just monitor the uh, body composition, uh, do a, do a bone, uh, bone mineral density, and IGF-1, and just monitor for a while and see how they get on. Okay, uh, good. Anything, Rasha, while I'm trying to select uh, other questions, any comments on that? Yeah, I can see 120 questions. Abdelhead, you are doing a very <laughs> yeah, difficult job. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was about to ask you how, how long you are prepared to stay, because there are lots of things. 120 <laughs> questions, Abdelhead, you are a fighter. Oh, there, oh, there, it is. Uh, but some, some of them are comments and some of them are answers to the multiple choice questions. So, yes. uh, but it's mostly transitional to stop it. We can start thyroxine and Down syndrome with a growth hormone deficiency and her with congenital hypo. Uh, let me, until you search, let me ask Mehal a question. Mehal, do you give growth hormone to Down syndrome patients? When do you decide? Do you give it or not? And when are you obliged to give it in a Down syndrome case? Okay, so normally the same criteria apply. We don't normally give growth hormone unless they're, you, they've got proven growth hormone deficiency. Okay. Yeah. Now, obviously, there's some children where they are extremely short, but we're really bound in the UK by our NICE guidelines, which only allow you to prescribe growth hormone for a certain range of conditions. So you would have to do what we call an independent funding request, which really is a very stringent process. Mm. And they want evidence to show that there is a possibility of it working. And in yeah. Down syndrome, that's the problem, that there are no long-term data. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now, uh, I found another interesting question. In subclinical hypothyroidism, as the first boy, is there, is, is there a chance to stop the thyroxine treatment? Uh, you mean in the one with idiopathic type? Yes. Yes, of course, there is a chance because we assume that he is. He doesn't have any risk factors anyway. He only what happened in that boy is that the TSH jumped above ten, and that's why we decided to treat. But he doesn't have positive antibodies or any thyroid pathology. So I think after a while we can stop and reassess the thyroid function after three months and see what happens. I'm speaking about idiopathic, not autoimmune. Yeah, the first, the first boy. Yeah. Yeah, idiopathic. Yeah, right. Another, another good question. Uh, what is the role of general pediatrician in cases of elevated TSH, according to the algorithm? The, what is the appropriate time to refer to specialist? That's a, that's a good question, I think. Yes, it's a very good question, especially that the neonatologists and the pediatrician see the patient before us, before the pediatric endocrinologist. I think, first of all, if the pediatrician couldn't make the correct decision, he should refer because hypothyroidism could be dangerous on the mentality and on the growth. But if the TSH is not rising, the baby is asymptomatic and it did not exceed 20, and the ultrasound is normal with no dysgenesis or any frank pathology in the thyroid, he could just repeat the thyroid functions after two weeks. If normalized, he can continue follow-up. If the TSH goes up, I think it's better to refer to a pediatric endocrinologist. Or if there is a definite thyroid pathology like dysgenesis from the beginning. So again, a TSH of more than 20, a rising TSH, a thyroid pathology by ultrasound. Dysgenesis, for example. Thank you. There's a question for Mehel. What is the younger age to start growth hormone in cases of hypobetatherism or pan -hypobetatherism? Well, as soon, as soon as you make the diagnosis, you can start, okay? And all the data suggests the earlier you start, the better long-term outcome. So if you've got, so you're not going to be able to do a growth hormone provocation test in the first year of life. So what you do is if you've got other hormone deficiencies, structurally mm -hmm. abnormal MRI, and the child is not growing, and as I say, usually within four months in the severe cases, you can show that they're not growing with a low IGF-1, then there's no reason to wait. You can start, yeah. and I, I start very gently. I start about 10 mics per kilo, and they respond mm. beautifully. Yeah. Do you think, Russia? Yes, yes. If, if we are sure that this is a case and we are lucky to diagnose it at a young age, yes, I think we, we should grasp this chance and start early. Yeah. As Mehal said, even with a smaller dose than the usual. Yeah, there's a question from Dr. Sam Tawfiq here. Uh, when you advise giving growth hormone, or sorry, GnRH analog in combination with growth hormone, at what age you give 
aromatase inhibitors. So there's like two questions. First one is when to when to give GNH, GNRH analog with the growth hormones. Very controversial. Yeah, yeah, extremely controversial. And you know, I think there are very few data to suggest that it really uh, is something that you should do very often. I think only in very exceptional cases where there's been a late diagnosis and you haven't got much time and puberty is marching on, then you would stop the puberty and allow them a bit more time. But remember that even you need the pubertal growth spurt, you need the uh, uh, androgens or estrogen to help you achieve a good height anyway. So growth hormone has to act in combination with them. Yeah. So you've got to be quite careful about that. Aromatase inhibitors, um, you only it's very experimental. And you, I only use them when the bone age is advanced, really, which, you know, very few growth hormone deficient children will have. Um, and, you know, you're absolutely desperate. I mean, it's more used in uh, idiopathic short stature with an advanced bone age. Um, uh, but it is experimental. Leo Dunkel advises against it, uh, except if you're part of a study. So I think one's got to be quite careful of that. Yeah. Anything, Grisha? What's your thoughts? Just uh, one practical uh, point after Mehel's comment, uh, adding GnRH analog, I think it's of no use and it could uh, contradict the spirit if the bone age in girls is more than 12 or 13 in boys. So it's not just giving or adding GnRH analog at any time. The timing is very important. Mm. We do not need to stop the growth spurt. So a bone age of 12 in girls and uh, 13 in boys. Do you think it depends on the context? For example, if you could CAH, then yes, sure. Some people, yeah, yeah, some people might might use this strategy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. There's another question: Is can we use? Well, there are some questions are repeated. I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> can we use exercise provocation instead of pharmacological provocation? We we answered this before. Is growth hormone? Is it is a growth hormone deficiency possible if you got low IGF one? And I think you both said possible, rare but possible. Is predicted adult height a reliable value for any person or misleading? I think this is an easy question to answer, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I, mean, I, I don't formally do all the height prediction software or anything like that, but it, with experience and with bone age, I think you know the prediction can be pretty good. So I think it, that is helpful. But you do sometimes there are surprises. So you've always got to be a little bit careful and cautious because puberty is a big sort of variable feature. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it is a lot faster in some people than others and they get a less of a growth spurt. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, uh, there's another question about the use of growth hormone in achondroplasia. Ah. <laughs> it's, it's a very good <laughs> question for you. Sadly, no, I'm afraid. <laughs> you've, you've, you've done you studies and you. really it doesn't do much. Yeah. Have you ever yeah. used it in Russia? Yeah, I tried it in some patients. Uh, they have a quite good response in the first year, and then I think it's of no use. It won't affect the height later on. It could be good in patients with hypo chondroplase, hypo. Yeah, with hypo, some of them do do better. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a comment from one of the audience saying it's a long discussion. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, you, you, anybody feels... Uh, it's it's too long or wants to leave, they can leave easily. I think we, we still have just a few questions to finish. And, oh, that's good. We'll go. We're reaching the last two questions. Uh, there was correct thyroid function test. This, this is a comment, I think. It depends on risk factor. Uh, it depends on risk factor. So they're just comment. They're saying, no, they are, people are answering questions to each other, answering their, uh, their own questions. They're saying, correct thyroid function uh, first and do priming for children more than 10 years. Well, I think this has already been said. Can we provide, can you provide us with a copy of SDS centile chart? I don't know who's, who the question is for. Is it for you? What SDS? Probably. What, what SDS centile chart? You mean the, the growth charts or? Standard deviation centile SDS centile chart. I think they're available yeah. on Google, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they are available in a lot of references. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. And I think... With and there are programs for that. They mean the growth, not the IGF. Do yeah. they mean the IGF SDSs or the growth, the height SDS? I think the growth chart. They said the growth SDS. The growth? Okay. Yeah, yeah it's That's available. The last question. Last question. Is there any rule of using growth hormone for patients uh, post-operative cardiac bypass surgery? 
post cardiac surgery. Yes. So I think if again, if the child is growth hormone deficient and you monitor it carefully, <clears throat> I would say that's fine. You can uh, use it. And, you know, I've also used it in a child with a, who's had a previous transplant and they weren't growing particularly well after that. And uh, they, were, they had a low IGF-1 and a borderline growth hormone response. And he's done pretty well on it. So they can respond, um, but I think you've got to pick the right patients. Yeah. Any comments? Last comment, Russia? No, nothing. Thank you. Okay. So finally, I'd like to thank all the audience. I'd like to thank Russia and Mehul for taking part in this uh, in this Q and A session and for their elegant talks, and uh, I'd also like to thank Sanders and uh, Folder for being patient with us, and I think it's been a very enjoyable evening. I learned a lot of things, and uh, I hope the rest of uh, you did the same. And uh, thank you very much, and hope uh, to meet you in the second wave. Any final comments you want to say? Mehul or Russia? No, yes, uh, uh, yes Mehul, please, you first. Yeah, no, I, actually, I've learned as well from Russia. So there you go. It's some of, some Thank of you. the data was new to me. So that's excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much, Mehul. Uh, in fact, it was nice because both of you were here. I'm so glad that you agreed to join us. Thank you very much, Mehul, for the great talk for answering the questions and bearing with us. And thank you very much, Abdel Hadi, for the excellent moderation and for giving us all the questions that you had and for arranging everything in a very uh, nice way. I'd also like to thank the audience for staying with us, to thank uh, Sanders and uh, Folder Company and looking forward to meeting you in the second wave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.